after what I heard from you, still I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that new technology and artificial intelligence will make people happy or happier? In principle, yes, it depends what we do with it. I mean, the simplistic idea that we just need to invent a new technology and by itself, it will improve people's lives. This doesn't work like that in history. Again, from the agricultural revolution, the invention of agriculture improved the life of some people, the kings and the aristocrats, but the lives of the vast majority of the population, the simple peasants, were in many respects harder than before. And it's the same with the industrial revolution. Again, sometimes the power of industry was used to benefit the whole population. Sometimes it was used to conquer and exploit and oppress millions of people. So the technology by itself, we can't rely on it. The key question is social and political. How does the political system choose to use the technology? And the question of usage is always political. And it shouldn't be left in the hands of engineers. Engineers are good in creating the technology, but they don't have the experience and they don't have the, man the mandate to decide what will be the social and political usages of the technology. Yes, but we know that politicians, they are so busy people. <laughs> you know, Brexit, election, re-election, you know, and all this, uh, what, all these problems, issues which they have to, sell, to solve now. Yeah. I mean, today, next month, and not later. But this painting which you painted, we need uh, at least portion of the attention to what will happen in 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. And uh, yeah. what, what we can do? Well, politicians, to a large extent, even in authoritarian regimes, react to the demands and to the opinions and the feelings of the population. Um, if politicians, for example, are pressed to view terrorism as a very important problem, they focus enormous attention and resources on that. Now, in my view, terrorism is a tiny, tiny threat compared with climate change or compared with artificial intelligence. More people die from nut allergy than from terrorism over the world. Uh, but because of political reasons and pressures from below, the politicians focus on that. We should change the focus of the political conversation. Yes, we still need to worry about terrorism, but we need to worry far more about climate change and AI. And this is one of the purposes of conferences like this, to change the global conversation. Um, again, it's true that politicians don't have a lot of time. But they still find time to have all these meetings about terrorism and to have invest billions in combating terrorism. So if they are pressured to focus this kind of attention on a problem like climate change, I think they can deliver. But it means that somebody has to tell this very compelling story, not only to politicians, but to their voters. Yeah. And I think there is huge, incredibly important role for intellectuals, to thinkers, and uh, uh, to great storytellers. And probably, from my point, point of view, you are the most influential storytellers. And I think what you are doing is incredibly imp important. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. You said that for these global problems, we need global solution. Probably it it's, looks like not very realistic. No. <laughs> not very realistic to imagine something like global government. But still, for example, in 1941, it was impossible to imagine that in 1951, we will have already Paris Treaty and almost we will have European Union. What do you think? 
Ah. This time we also will need something extremely catastrophic. Do we need one more I world war number, something? Or wisdom of mankind will be enough? What do you think? I hope we don't need another lesson like the lessons we got in the 20th century. Uh, but maybe it will be like that. Maybe we have to repeat some of our mistakes of the previous centuries to learn the same lesson again. I, I come from university, I teach students, I know that you sometimes need to make the same mistake again and again until you learn. Unfortunately, in this case, the mistake could uh, cost the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So I hope the lessons of the past century are enough but looking at what's happening in the last three or four years in the world, um, I'm not very optimistic. Um, still, we are still living in the, for humans in the best situation ever. The most peaceful, the most prosperous situation ever. The, we can fall very, very far, very, very quickly. People don't realize it. But we are really on the edge of, of the precipice. And how, no matter how bad you think things are right now, they could be far, far worse. And part of the mission of historians and anthropologists and intellectuals in general is to serve as some kind of, you know, this common memory of humankind that we don't have to repeat the same mistakes again and again. Yeah, for example, I remember it's an iconic example when Albert Einstein wrote a letter to, to Truman when he explained how dangerous nuclear weapon is. And after that, as I remember, nothing like that happened. Probably the uh, most influential scientist and uh, intellectual, that you have to make something really very, very warning. You have, I, it's not about letters, but so, something really very very proactive. The best thinkers, you have to tell something to politicians. They are busy now. And price uh, will be huge. And they will explain, oh, we, we miss time because of the Brexit or, or something else. Or, or yeah, I mean, some... when you think about the amount, no matter what you think about Brexit, good idea, bad idea, leave it aside. You just think about the amount of time and energy that the most important people and influential people in the world have spent on Brexit in the last four years, when they could have spent it on something else, like climate change, this is really shocking. So, again, it's not, it's not that the idea in itself is bad. It's the opportunity cost. That in 20 years, when we need to explain maybe to the next generation, why didn't you do something about climate change or about artificial intelligence in time, we will be forced to tell them, well, you know, you have this, this Brexit thing. It looked to us far more important at the time than dealing with the rise of AI or stopping climate change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Professor Harari, now I want to ask you about question related to where we are in, in Ukraine. Yes. Yeah, when I went to buy your 20 one lesson for 21st century, and of course I asked uh, book in, in Russian language because it's my native language. And I learned that there is no Russian version, and I, I was happy to buy Ukrainian uh, version, and, and, and great, I was happy to read this in Ukrainian after that in English. But when I started to read after one hour, I understood perfectly why there is no Russian version because you gave very powerful examples about fake news, about post-truth, and it was exactly about Russian propaganda, fake news, about invasion uh, to Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, etc., etc., and all this. Uh, it's a very compelling story. Mm -hmm. I immediately understood why it's very uncomfortable for Russian publisher to publish this. But when uh, this Russian edition, when it happened, we had here in Ukraine very emotional yeah. discussion, especially in the social network. I read your explanation, and for me it was very, very logical and uh, convincing, but still, 
I think for Ukrainian audience will be very, very interesting and very important to listen uh, your position about it. Yeah, it was, it was a difficult, yeah. it was a, a very difficult dilemma uh, for me too. I mean, first, I have to explain that some changes in the Russian edition were made without my knowledge and permission, like they changed conquest of Crimea to something like joining or whatever. And these things that were made without my permission, I'm working on, on correcting. But some changes were made with my knowledge and permission. Uh, the reason for that is, well, as, as you all know, Russia is not a democracy. Not, they don't respect the freedom of expression there. And in my new book, there is a lot of criticism of the Russian regime. And I was told that really, I, um, if I, they won't allow to publish and distribute this book, and if I try, it could jeopardize my publishers and distributors. So I had this really dilemma, two options, to agree to change some things and be able to publish and reach the Russian audience, or not to change anything and not to publish the book at all. And I respect the people who say that in this situation, it's best not to publish at all. But I think it's an extreme and somewhat unhelpful position because um, actually, this is what the Russian regime wants more than anything else, that such books will not be published at all. Especially because the book, you know, the book is really not about Ukraine or Russia or Crimea. It's mostly about these issues of climate change and AI and the threat of digital dictatorships and so forth. And it's very important to have the Russian people in this conversation. It's a global conversation. If you exclude people who live in undemocratic societies from the conversation, it won't be global. So I agreed to make some compromises in order to reach the Russian audience. Now, my rule is, I don't agree to anything. My rule is that I'm not willing to write any lies. I'm not willing to add any praise to the regime. And I'm not willing to change my key ideas. But sometimes I am willing to change the examples that I use to explain the ideas, because you can explain the same idea with different examples. And even after the changes in the book, which amount to less than 1% of the book, uh, the book is still very critical of the Russian regime and of its ideology. And um, I, I, for, for me, this was the most important thing. Now, again, some people may not agree, and I, I agree, it's a, it's a difficult dilemma. It's a choice between two bad options. Um, and part of what I'm doing now in Ukraine is talk with people about it, people who know the situation much better than me, and to get a better understanding and uh, perhaps change my decision. It's not... Uh... I just want to confirm that I completely supportive. I agree with your decision. It was very important to publish uh, this book for a Russian audience and that was the only way. I understand this. I want to continue uh, a little bit ab about uh, this Russian and Ukrainian mm -hmm. situation, Russian-Ukrainian conflict. And I, I think, from my point of view, we can think about this from point of view of fight battle of, let's say, two stories. One is uh, imperial, totalitarian, Russian story. Also, it's a story about Ukraine, their mm -hmm. view, that we are artificial state, etc., etc. And another story is Ukrainian story about freedom, about uh, democracy. I think it's one story is about past and our story is about future. But this is my mm -hmm. way to think about this. But uh, and and this is, that's why we are under attack, because our story is very inspirational and infectious also for all region, including Russia, especially young generation. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on yes, this? Um, yeah, I'm not an expert on Russia or Ukraine. One of the reasons when you invited me half a year ago to come here, so one of the reasons I, ac I ac accepted is because I really wanted to come and visit Ukraine in person because it's one of the most important places in the world right now. It's really in the forefront 
of the struggle for freedom, both against internal dictatorship and against external invasion and imperialism. And it's such a complicated situation. And you hear so many conflicting stories that without actually coming and talking to people, it's almost impossible to, to really understand uh, what, what is happening. And yes, there is this, this clash of narratives. And the reason that the, maybe the eyes of, of the whole world are now focused on Ukraine is because the story of liberal democracy, which, you know, 10, 20 years ago seemed to be like invincible, like the wave of the future, over the last three or four years, it's been in decline, people losing faith in this story and thinking that that's the end of, of liberal democracy, the future belongs again to authoritarian regimes. And Ukraine is like a spot of light where people still have faith in the values of, of freedom and of openness. And that's why everybody's looking, what, will it succeed? If it succeeds in Ukraine, it will spread to other places. And I think that one of the dynamics between Russia and Ukraine now is that if Ukraine succeeds, it will make an enormous difference to Russia also. Because the Russians will say, hey, if they can do it, why can't us? And this actually makes it very difficult, the situation of Ukraine, because it implies that it has a very powerful neighboring regime that actually wants it to fail, which is quite rare in the world. In many cases around the world, neighbors are indifferent to each other. Or they want their neighbors to succeed, or they are indifferent, but they don't want their neighbors to actually fail. Like the US and Mexico, so maybe the current regime in the US is not so favorable to Mexico, but certainly the US has no interest that Mexico will fail, that the Mexican economy will collapse, that the Mexican democracy will collapse. But here, the impression is that the neighboring regime has a real interest in failure, and that's, that's, that's a big problem. What I would say, again, I'm not an expert on, on Ukraine, but what I would say as a historian, is that Ukrainians should free themselves from this deterministic thinking that the past dictates the future, which is very common in authoritarian and backward-looking regimes. As a historian, I tell you, history has no deterministic power over you. Uh, Ukraine suffered through a series of tragedies over the last century, but the past doesn't determine its future. And I think maybe the best example to think about is Germany, that also in 1945, many people said there is something about the German nature or German culture or German history that simply makes it impossible to build a liberal democracy in Germany. History is against it. And as we all know, this was a complete error. 70 years later, Germany is one of the most liberal, democratic, and peaceful countries in the world. So history is not destiny. You need to know your history and to respect it, but not to be enslaved by it. You can create a completely new page in history. Yeah, thank you. In your books, you you uh, explain that in 20th century uh, we had three main stories: uh, communism, fascism, and liberal story. And now, unfortunately, we don't have any story. Mm -hmm. And this is big problem. And. Uh, I said that uh, this, your uh, story about global governance or global cooperation it, for solving global problems, mm -hmm. it has chance to become a really, really next very big story. And for me, frankly speaking, it will be not big surprise if 
uh, force a really big story will come from Yerushalayim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and, uh, but my question is, uh, what do you think from this point of view about importance of global cooperation? What do you think about future of the great story, uh, future of European Union? Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I'm not a prophet, I don't know. I wish it the best. I hope that the European Union would succeed because it is the best examples we have so far of how to create harmony without uniformity. We have a lot of examples in history of disharmony, different countries fighting each other. We have a lot of examples of harmony being achieved by imposing a single government, a single empire on, on everybody. This is the imperial model. The EU is a different model of 28 or maybe soon 27 different countries with different cultures and languages and so forth that nevertheless manage to work together most of the time towards common goals. And this should be an inspiration for the rest of the world. I don't think that global government is a realistic or even a desirable goal. It won't happen anytime soon unless it's an empire. Our goal should be that yes, we still have all over the world 200 independent nations, but they are still able to cooperate in key areas uh, to confront our common challenges. And I would say maybe that um, a good institution to emulate it's not just the EU, it's the World Football Cup. That if you think about the World Football Cup, it's really amazing. I mean, you have people from France and Argentina and Japan coming together to play football in Russia and agreeing on all the rules. You couldn't do something like that a thousand years ago. And the amazing thing about the World Football Cup, it's not anti-national. It doesn't push nationalism aside. It gives nationalism certain st stage. We are talking about national teams competing against each other. Immense patriotism involved, but still they all agree on the same rules. If they don't agree on the rules, the whole thing collapses. And um, so this I think is, is, is a model of, for the world as, as a whole. I would say if you like the World Football Cup, then you're a globalist. Because that's, I know that there are some people who say, oh, globalists are people who believe that we should abolish all nations and we should flood Europe with tens of millions of immigrants and destroy all local culture. But that's nonsense. That's not, glo not, not globalism. If you want to see globalism in action, look at the World Football Cup. That's, that's a much better view or, 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 or vision. From sport, I want to jump for a minute to the art. As art collector, I have mm -hmm. a question uh, about contemporary art. For many years, I love to say that contemporary art is the, one of the most revolutionary force in the world. Very rare people ask me, this is one of the most, and which else? And I said, only one, it's science. Mm. Art and science. And my explanation was that art is responsible for our inner world and science about outer world. But after your lecture, I understand that now there is competition between art and science even for our inner world. And tell me, please, do you think that in the nearest future, or, yeah, in, in, in the nearest future, Artificial intelligence will be able to create something even more inspirational than, than artists. And maybe artificial intelligence will make artists also useless class. What do you think? I am worried about this. Um, that depends on how we understand art. A lot of people think that the main aim of art is to inspire certain human emotions to inspire joy, sometimes sadness, all kinds of emotions. Like the artist is, no matter if it's a painter or a pianist or a TV producer, 
they are actually playing on the keyboard of human emotions. Like I create a scene in a TV show and I hope that people will cry. And then the next scene, they should laugh. If this is art, then very soon AI will first be a tool and then a competition for human artists because AI will increasingly have a better understanding of the human emotional system and how to press the different buttons, even on the level of individuals. Something that makes you cry may not make me cry, but an AI that monitors me 24 hours a day will know better than anybody else in the world what to do in order to make me cry. So if we think about art as kind of playing on the human emotional keyboard, then I think AI will very soon revolutionize art completely. Of course, there are other definitions for what art is, but you know, throughout history, there was always this ongoing debate of what is art, and our conceptions of art today are very different from the Middle Ages or from ancient times. Thank you. Uh, Professor Harai, uh, uh, I think I have time for last question and I want to use this unique opportunity because there is perception you are almost a, a, a prophet, but if not, at least you are definitely one of the most influential intellectuals. And I want to ask you, maybe you have some advices for Ukrainians and maybe for our political leaderships. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly not a prophet. I have no idea what's going to happen next year or in five years. Um, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. As I said earlier, I really, the main motivation to come here, be, except for, of course, this conference, was to learn and not to tell people what to do. I think it's very, very dangerous for experts uh, in one field to start telling people what to do in fields, in places that they don't really understand. This is one of the reasons that experts then lose their ability to influence. People no longer listen to them. Um, the one thing I can say generally, it's true of Ukraine, it's true of many other countries, um, is as I said before, that as a historian, this is my, I come from the field of history, that the main thing about studying history is not to learn from history, and so, because then you, you kind of become enslaved by it. You think that what happened in the past will just repeat itself. The main purpose is to free yourself from history, to be able to create new things. But for that, you really need to know your history. Otherwise, it continues to control you without, you, without your knowledge. Um, I, I think that the best examples we have or what really defines a great people is a people who knows the truth about itself, including about the dark pages in its history. A people that doesn't fall for the infantile fantasy of being perfect. That one of the signs of a sick society is when people have this image of themselves that our people are perfect we never make any mistakes. We are victims. Anything bad that happens, it's because of others. That's a childish way of thinking. And just as individuals grow up and realize that they are not perfect as individuals, and they need a better understanding of their weaknesses and dark sides, and this enables real progress, it's also the same for entire nations. And what I see now is that Ukraine is really doing exactly this process, and I hope it will continue and succeed. Thank you very much, Professor Harari. Uh, now, Thank you. Now, my, my, my time with Professor Harari, unfortunately for me, finished, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I want to invite on this stage next moderator, President of Estonia, Kirsty Karolai. And you will speak with Professor Harari about rule of law. Thank you very much, Professor. For Thank me, you. it was a great honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm.